Yeah, yeah, I was just waiting because there was a whole bulk of people coming in, so I thought it's, what's that? Oh, the, the cover fell off. Uh, oh. Good, good. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, well, I'll continue the introduction to tensor networks and let me just briefly remind you what, uh, where we got to yesterday. So what we talked about was uh, the physics of quantum many body systems. So specifically systems where the interactions between the individual quantum particles play a strong role, so which we can't understand just by looking at individual particles and kind of looking at the entanglement only in a corrective fashion. These systems were basically governed by some Hamiltonian, which was a local interaction on some kind of lattice, like a 1D or 2D lattice. And then what we realized is that these kind of systems, if we have n particles, live in some Hilbert space CD to the n, which has a very high dimension, namely a dimension which grows exponentially with a number of particles, which was prohibitive for efficient description of a state of such a system if you wanted to describe the full state. But then what we also saw is that basically in this huge Hilbert space, there was kind of a small corner of physical states, simply from the intuition that we only needed very few parameters to describe the Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian term would describe the ground state. So this motivated to ask what's special about these states? Can we understand from a point of view of entanglement of quantum information, what makes these states special? And then what I told you is that these states are very special in, in the sense of their entanglement. So I should indeed maybe stress that what we care for in this corner are things like ground states. Since these exhibit the strongest quantum effects. And they're very special in their entanglement. Namely, when we would take a, a lattice system, say, and look at the entanglement of a region A with the rest, then the entanglement of A with the rest, which we could compute as the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state only on system A, would scale like the boundary of, of A rather than the volume. So only very few degrees of freedom, effectively very few degrees of freedom in any region A would be entangled with the outside. So in particular, in one dimension, the boundary of the region, of course, is only on the left and on the right. So in one dimension, this would mean that the entanglement between any region A and the rest would be bounded by a constant, basically. It might grow initially as we make a region bigger, but then it will saturate and not go beyond that constant. So that's the starting point for today's lecture. So today I would like to start from this point and motivate how one, one can write on an explicit way, an explicit ansatz of describing many body wave functions, which kind of has this property that entanglement is only, only located at the boundary, but for any way of partitioning our system, and how from there we can actually understand the behavior of quantum many body systems better. Okay, so this would be um, part two. In the basics of tensor network states. In one dimension. 
So I will start with one dimension because many things are easier there. We can also make stronger statements. And later on in one of the subsequent lectures, I will also tell you a few things about two dimensions and higher dimensions. So what's the construction, the idea? So what we would like to do is, I mean, if, if we think about this area law construction, one dimension or in two dimensions, what this tells us, if we have a spin chain, and we look at some region, and it has this entanglement, uh, um, this area law behavior regarding its entanglement with the rest, what this tells is that we would assume the entanglement is only uh, located at the boundary. So we could say, OK, well, why don't we try to take this particle and entangle it in some way with that particle? And similarly, this particle entangle with that particle. And the rest of the chain, we don't really have to care, because this kind of has a right behavior. The entanglement is located at the boundary. But of course, the problem is this doesn't work if we put our cut somewhere else. Say, if we take our cut and we extend it to here, then this behavior is suddenly gone, right? The entanglement is, there's no long, long entanglement here. So we could, of course, put some entangled state here. But then still in some other cut, like, say, in this cut, we would still have the same problem, right? There would still be no entanglement. So that's, that's, that's something which kind of, as a cartoon picture, might work, but it's kind of not good enough, right? Simply because it doesn't respect the translational symmetry of our lattice, right? If we entangle specific states, if we entangle that state with the one to the left, we can't at the same time entangle it with the state to the right. And that's due to this property known as monogamy of entanglement, right? We cannot have entanglement shared with several different parties at the same time. So if we really were to take this particle, entangle it with the one to the left, we will not be able to entangle to the one to the right. And this doesn't give the right behavior of the entanglement. We want that the entanglement is kind of the same in every cut. Let's say we, we consider a system which is translation invariant, right, which behaves the same everywhere. We don't want different cuts to behave differently. So that's too easy. So what we will do instead is the following thing. We will start from our spin chain. And we'll first say, well, let's for a moment imagine that each of these particles is actually composed of two particles, one kind of left and one right particle. And I'll tell you in a moment how this construction works explicitly. So let's for now just assume this is some kind of very hand-wavy construction that we take each particle and we replace it by two particles, which together in some way build up the original particle. So it kind of consists of quarks or whatever, right? Don't take this literally. Um, so now what we have at each side, we have, we have, we have two sub subsystems which make up our system. And now we can indeed do what I tried to do here. We can try to start building up entanglement to both sides simply because, well, now we can take this particle here and entangle it with the one to the right. And the other one, and entangle it with the one to the left. So now we can build up a construction like that. And now you certainly see it has this kind of property we wanted that whenever we make a cut somewhere, we cut through this entangled pair, or this entangled pair, and so on. So regardless of what region we cut, we will always have the same amount of entanglement of that region with the outside, and the, the entanglement will always be located close at the boundary in some sense. But of course, I'm still kind of very sketchy in the way I, I explain this construction. So, so what are these states here? Well, let's, let's be a bit more concrete. Let's assume that each of these two systems has a capital D-dimensional Hilbert space. So I have a space CD times CD. And this state here, I say, will be a state omega, which is a maximally entangled state. So I just maximally entangled these two particles. 
Of course, this means that they have a very specific construction, the entanglements of a very specific type, but we will add in an extra layer which will make this more rich later on. So as I said, what we have now is that the state kind of has a right entanglement behavior. Entanglement sits at a boundary across any cut I can choose. But of course, it's not very rich, right? It's basically only one state. The only thing I can change is this dimension, so I have a discrete set of states. So that's, of course, not, not rich enough for what I want. So what we will do, erase this thing up here. What we will do is we will, add a, we will basically add a construction which will give us back the original particles. And what this construction will do is it will take these two guys here. So what I have is I have a CD dimensional space here and a CD dimensional space here with some capital D. Now I will put these two guys together and I have to describe how I get my original particle back. And the means of doing that is to say, well, let's take these two particles and apply some linear map which out of this space of a left and a right particle maps out an effective space for, for, for the model I want to describe. So it's just some general linear map So one thing I could, for instance, do is if, if this system here is a qubit, a two-level system, I will necessarily have too many degrees of freedom up here, right? Because let's say even one capital D is two and this one is two, I have a four-dimensional space. So to get to a two-dimensional space, I, I might want to project onto a specific degree of freedom of that space, or well, a two-dimensional subspace of that space. So a typical choice for this P might actually be a projection which only keeps the, the relevant degrees of freedom. You could think of this as perturbation theory kind of singling out a low energy space, right? In which kind of the low energy physics takes place and there are very high lying excitations which are leading out of that space. You don't have to think of that. It's really more a mathematical construction, but you could motivate it from perturbation theory. So this P could be a projection which keeps some interesting degrees of freedom for us, but it doesn't have to be a projection. It could be any other linear map as well. So we will do this at every site. And this way, what we get is a, a way of obtaining a chain on our original system. And as we will see in the following, this, this P actually allows to do many things. So for instance, before we applied this P, we had no correlations whatsoever between anything here and anything there, right? Because the only connection was through these entangled states between nearest neighbors, but not on a longer distance. But by adding in a projection here, for instance, we can create longer range entanglement. We can create longer range correlations. So the state gets much, much more rich that way. Now, generally, we, we, we might want that these states, these P's, to depend on the site. So it depends what we want to describe. If we want to describe a translation invariant state, we might choose all, all of them the same. If we're not sure if our system is translation invariant or we just want to introduce extra parameters, we can make them site dependent. So I will put the site as a superscript here in brackets. So to each site S, there corresponds a map PS. Excuse me? Well, well it, goes, it goes to a smaller space, so I'm not sure. Well, if you, probably an isometry, if you're more strict, if I say projection, right, because it goes into a smaller space. But it can be any linear map, in fact, right? It's just that kind of, if, if you think what would be a natural choice, you might say, oh, well, I'm in a big space, and I want to single out an effective space. And then you would project onto that effective space, which is, say, two-dimensional. And actually, many, many canonical examples have a projector as a map P, but there's no obligation to choose a projection. So any map will do. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. If you're strict, it should be an isometry. You should call it isometry and not projection, right? Well, I should call it. <laughs> no, indeed. So, so it's, it's not a projection in the sense that it doesn't map between a space and itself. So in that sense, it would be an isometry. 
Now, people tend to, to refer to this P nevertheless as a projector, even if it's neither a projector nor an isometry, but just a linear map, just out of convention, and because several examples have this projection construction. Okay. So we can do this, this construction for different uh, uh, types of systems. So as I said, we can, we can uh, for instance, enforce translation invariance. We can do it with open boundary conditions. Which would mean that on the left, we only have one of these entangled pairs. Let me stick to my color scheme. So we might have endpoints which are different. We can do it for periodic boundaries, in which case we would connect the entangled pairs on the two ends. So we would do something like putting entangled pairs and then connecting the last one and the first one again, like putting it on a ring. So we can adapt this to different situations, and I will change this a bit throughout the next lectures, what I consider. Ah, no, but, no but, but, but that's what I call a site is this, right, of the original lattice. The original lattice, like that's the green things, the green things are sites of the original lattice. It's just when I make this construction, I split these sites up in, in kind of auxiliary step, in an intermediate step, I split the sites up into two, except at the boundary, which I don't split up. So, so in that sense, once you split up all guys in the middle, you will always end up with an even number of, of these sites. Oh. Okay, so, so in principle, we can, we can generalize it further, right? So what I said is that these entangled states are all the same, C, D, C, D. But in principle, we could even make this, time. So, so in that case, this would also be a C capital D. These particles should all be the same, usually, if you consider a normal spin chain. So that's all small d dimensions. That's capital D dimensions. So which, in particular, I mean that this map here, P1 is different, right? P1, it's a bit larger, P1 only maps a single one of these auxiliary particles to a single one of the physical particles. So it might have a different structure. It might even map from a smaller to a bigger space or things like that. Now, more generally, if I don't insist on translation invariance, I could make everything site dependent, not only the P, but also the, the dimension of this particle. Now, in some senses, this doesn't make the ansatz more rich because, of course, I can always choose a maximal dimension and just choose to ignore the, the extra degrees of freedom. But, of course, in, in the sense of having an efficient description, it might still make sense to keep that in mind. No problem. The, the, the pairs connected with squiggly lines are maximally entangled. Right, so, so what I do is I, I put these two guys into a maximally entangled state. And these two guys, right, but then I apply these maps in a displaced fashion. So the idea is that these pairs will build up entanglement between this side here and that side here. And while this kind of also builds up entanglement in some sense. Well, it singles out kind of the degrees of freedom I'm interested in, but it also starts building up correlations on a longer distance. <coughs> Sorry? Uh, well, thermodynamic limit is a subtle thing. I would prefer not to talk about the thermodynamic limit in detail because it's getting very mathematical. 
Um, it's a very interesting question. It can be properly defined here. Um, well, you would indeed think that in some element limit, it doesn't matter so much what your boundary conditions are, as long as you only look in the inside. So in that, in, in that case, you would indeed probably, well, first of all, you want translation invariance. Then it indeed doesn't matter. But kind of the subtle thing is, of course, in the thermodynamic limit, you only want to look at a small region of a long chain, right? Because if the chain is infinite, it doesn't make sense to talk of the whole chain. Um, and then indeed, it turns out that things converge nicely. It doesn't matter what you do at a long distance. So in, in, in that context, these states are known as finitely correlated states. That's something which has been done in the early 90s by Van Nachter, Halle, and Werner, where they work out a mathematical formalism to define the thermodynamic limit properly for these states. Okay. Of what, sorry? It looks like that. Uh, well, there's a relation of that to the normalization group. I'm not sure if it's a generalization. I wouldn't. <coughs> How important is that the fragments uh, are interacting and the fragment is relevant to the. I mean, there are no interacting features, that means. Mm, well, we talk about spin systems here, but you can do the same thing for fermions, and you can do it for non interacting fermions. So. Um, it does work. I mean, maybe I'm, I'm thinking whether I should give one example right now to illustrate the construction. It might actually be a good idea, even though the example will only show up later on um, in more detail. But maybe just to, to give you a kind of more physics intuition how this, uh, how this might look like, let me give one example which is known as the AKLT state. So what AKLT stands for Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, and Hazaki. Not sure, I guess the original paper is something like 88 or 89. Okay, so, so what is a construction? Um, the construction is slightly different. I'm not sure if it's a perfect example, but uh, it's a kind of somewhat practical example. So what we do is that our entangled states will consist of two spin one halves. So we have a two-level system here, a two-level system here. But now it's really a spin one half. It really transforms like a spin one half particle. And this state we now put in a different state. Maybe I shouldn't call it omega. Let me call it omega tilde. namely a singlet state. So spin, zero is spin up, one is spin down. So we put in a singlet state. So it especially means that this state transforms nice, it transforms trivially under spin rotations, under any action of the rotation group. So now we make a chain of these guys. So we have all these spin one half particles, and now we really think of them as spins. So that's really a spin one half particle. And well, now what we want to do is we want to take each two of these guys and look at some effective degree of freedom or so kind of glue them together in a way which makes up something more interesting than just two spin one-halves which don't have anything to do with each other. So what can we do? Well, we have two spin one-halves. I mean, what kind of, what would be a natural way if we want to respect symmetry, spin symmetry? Well, we know that two spin one-halves can be decomposed as either a spin zero or a spin one, right? So the total Hilbert space of two spin one-half particles has a spin zero subspace and a spin one subspace. So a natural choice with respect to spin rotation symmetry would be to either choose these degrees of freedom or these degrees of freedom. Now choosing the spin zero degree of freedom is not very exciting, right? Because after we project onto the spin zero, that's a one-dimensional space. We're just left with a chain of spin zero particles. 
not very exciting, so maybe it's a better idea to keep the spin one degree of freedom. So what we do is we apply a map P, which does what? Well, P is equal to the projection onto the total spin equal one. But really more in the sense of an isometry, right? As a map acting from, acting from two spin one half particles onto a spin one particle three level system, right? So we just, I mean, we can write it down explicitly because we know what the spin one states are, right? So we know that basically what we do is we have a total SC equals plus one, which corresponds to the zero, zero state, the two spins up state. We have an SC equals zero, which corresponds to the triplet state. Zero, one, plus one, zero, divided by square root of two. And we have an SC equal minus one, which corresponds to both spins pointing down. And if we add these three, that's P. And we apply this everywhere then. So what we get this way down here is a spin one chain. And so we'll get back to this construction later on. But it, it has a number of nice features. So in particular, one feature we get by this construction that it's not just a spin one chain in the sense of having three level system, but it actually transforms nicely under the spin rotation. And the reason is that we start from singlets which are invariant under rotating everywhere, right? If we apply a, a rotation everywhere about any axis, the state will be invariant because it's just composed of singlets. And the second thing is if I apply any rotation here, whether I apply a rotation before projecting or after projecting onto the spin one space doesn't matter, right? The rotation of the two spin one halves is the same as a rotation on this space and on that space. So if I just keep this space, whether I rotate here or here, doesn't matter. So rotating here is the same as rotating here on these auxiliary particles I used in the construction. So I obtain this asymmetric wave function. And well, this wave function has a number of other nice features. It has non-trivial correlations. It's a unique ground state of a local Hamiltonian. That's all things which I, well, hopefully will mention in, in one of the next lectures. Sorry? Well, that's one way how we can think of the construction, I guess. Right? Saying I want to spin one chain. Uh, let's uh, try to think of it as an effective. I, I mean, you can see that you could get this in some kind of perturbation theory if you, look, you say you actually have a spin one half chain like this. But here you have a Hamiltonian which is very strong and which forces these guys to be in, in the joint spin one state. So then kind of the effective effectively accessible space at low energies will only be the spin one space. So you put a high energy on, 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 the, tri on the singlet. And then you could say these singlets get established by having a weaker interaction, which acts as a perturbation between these guys trying to put them in a singlet. And then if you do perturbation theory, you just get the projection of the, well, the interaction which wants singlets on this effective subspace, the spin one subspace. So if you want, you can think of this as an effective low energy theory. It's not necessary, but it's certainly possible. Okay. So, okay, maybe I put this back here. Let me just fix a bit nomenclature because I will keep using that. So, so the red particles we will call virtual or auxiliary particles. or systems or whatever. The green one's physical, I guess that's more natural. The entangled states, the entangled pairs will also be denoted as bonds. Because they create some kind of entanglement, some correlation between different particles. And well, since I will probably use it anyway, um, let me already tell you that this is what is called a matrix product state. 
Let me put this over there, maybe. Can I raise this? No. Okay, so we have that construction. We could also write it as a formula, right? So rather than um, drawing a picture, we can also write formulas, obviously. So what do we have to do? We have to start from a state omega acting between n sides. And then what we have to do is we have to apply P1 times P2. Let's say we look at periodic boundary conditions. So basically, it's just a, a number of these maps P applied to a number of entangled states. Of course, this is kind of misleading if I write it like that, because the real point is, of course, that the partition in which these maps act is shifted with respect to the partition in which I put my states. Otherwise, I wouldn't get something very interesting. Um, so one can write it, obviously, in this form, but one has to keep in mind that the systems on which the individual things act are kind of shifted. So if you label the subsystems, you could say this is one left, one A, one B, two A, two B, but then the entangled states would be between one B, two A, then between two B, three A, and so on, right? So there's some shifting in the index. Okay, these states are also known as matrix product states. And let me see, I actually wanted to say something else first, but maybe I rearrange things and first explain why they're called, yes, let, so let me rearrange things first and let me first explain why they're called matrix product states and then tell you a few things about their properties. Okay, so, so let, 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 let me just uh, have another look at this formula I just wrote, kind of the explicit expression for the state. So we have that we can think of this state as being created, say, on periodic boundaries by acting with all these P's. On our entangled states. And now we can ask, well, can we maybe derive a more explicit expression for the form of this psi. So what we also know is that obviously we can expand psi in some basis of our space. We had this expression last time already when we talked about the exponentially big Hilbert space. So we could ask, can we derive an explicit expression maybe for the C I1 to I n in terms of the map P and, and the state omega? Now the state omega we know, right? So what do we have? We have omega is this maximally entangled state. And well, we have the map P at some side S can be expanded in a basis. So we have that alpha and beta go from one to D, and I goes from one to small d. So I just basically express this map P in a basis where I have a three index object, A, I, alpha, beta for each side S, right? So what this does is it takes the auxiliary particle in state alpha and beta and maps it to state I. So now let's try to see if we can understand what this expression should evaluate to, if we want to get such something of that form. 
And of course, we don't want to write everything at once, right? This is a very long expression. So it might make more sense to go step by step. So what we would like to do is we would like to start from kind of the simplest building block. Which, well, the initial thing is that we have a map acting from two systems to one, right? We have this map acting from two systems to one. And now we can try to do some kind of first step. And as a first step in constructing this state, we will attach an entangled state and a second side. So we will take this entangled state, and we will append it. So we would have p1 and p2. So you see this forms an inductive step, right? Because what I have here is something which maps a left auxiliary particle and a right auxiliary particle to a physical system. And this is the same thing. It maps a left and a right auxiliary particle to something physical, which is now bigger. And you see I can do an inductive step, right? What I did is I kind of took I took this input system here, and I attached another system, right? And here I can do the same. I can attach a system there and continue. So if I understand one step, and it turns out to have sufficiently nice structure, I can inductively see what I get if I keep on doing that. So what do I get in one such step? Well, what I have at, so let's just write down what we have at the right. So we have P1. times P2 apply to omega sitting between sides one and two, which is what? Well, lots of summation indices for one thing. Then we have these P's, so we have A1, I1, alpha, beta, I1, alpha, and beta. So what do we have? That's I1, I2. We have an alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, OK? OK, so we tensor this with A2, I2, gamma, delta. This is just a big summation index now over alpha, beta, gamma, delta, I1, and I2. So this, is, this thing here is P1 times P2, right? Now I have to put omega. Write this over some over k. There's a 1 over square root of d, and then there is a k, k. That's pretty lengthy, but if you want to understand what's happening, we have to see what belongs to what. So where is something non-trivial happening? Well, the non-trivial part takes place here. We have an entangled state and act with a map on it, right? So we have these two guys. That's the entangled state. Let me label my sites. So this is site A, B, C, and D here, OK? So we know where we are. So this is A. This is B. This is C, this is D. And similarly here, this is B, and this is C. So what we see is that this K belongs to this beta here, right? So what I get is I get the overlap of the, well, basis vector beta with a basis vector K, which will give me a delta. Well, that's a bit of an unfortunate notation. So this is a Kronecker delta, right, unlike the other deltas. So this tells me beta and k will have to be equal. And on the C system, gamma and k meet. So this tells me that gamma and k have to be equal. And well, if I do the sum over k, it tells me that the sum drops out, the delta drops out. And together with the sum over k, 
it tells me that beta has to be equal to gamma, right? Because beta has to be equal to k, k has to be equal to gamma, but it can take all possible values with the same weight. So up to this one over square root of d, all what this maximally entangled state tells me is that beta is equal to gamma. Or if you look at this picture, there's a maximally entangled state, well, which is exactly of this form. So its effect is that it exactly forces this spin and this spin to have the same value. Right? So it exactly enforces that what I have here and I have here has the same value. So from that, we can... So what does this give us? So we have the sum here. We have A1, I1, alpha, beta. The beta index here is gone, right? We only have this because this was contact with a K, only this one remains. Then here we had a gamma originally, but this gamma is now equal to beta, so we put beta. And now that's, that's not perfect. Actually, we would like to express it the same, the same way as the original P. We want an inductive procedure. We want to write it like that, something mapping input indices to output indices. So we will just take this guy and put it here. And let me single out the sum over beta, okay? So I just collected these two A's here. And I well, collected my cat and bra vectors. So what we see now is this map is very similar. It takes the auxiliary virtual degrees of freedom alpha and delta now, like the ones at the boundary in that picture, and maps it now to two physical spins. And what's, what's the coefficient? The coefficient is given exactly by that expression here. So we can leave it like that, but we can also note that if we think of this guy as a matrix, so if you think of this as a matrix, with alpha and beta as a matrix indices, what is happening here is that we're carrying out a matrix multiplication, right? Because we're summing the right index of the left matrix with the left index of the right matrix. So what this really is, this is the product of these two matrices and that evaluated the matrix element alpha delta. So then what we see from that, if we just write it in this form, is that this total composition of this map P1, P2 is the omega. It's really almost of the same form as before. just that instead of having a single matrix A like we had here, this matrix A got replaced by the product of two of these A's for the two consecutive sides. So now you can immediately see that we can derive an iterative uh, recipe from that, right? So we can iterate this construction. And what happens is that if then we have something like P1 times P2 times P3 applied to omega 1, 2 times omega 2, 3. What we would get, for instance, would be something like that we have to multiply three of these guys, A1, I1, A2, I2, A3, I3.
evaluated at some, let me call this beta again, element alpha beta. And now we have a product of three matrices and so on, right? So we can just keep doing that. The only question is what happens at the boundary. And what happens at the boundary, well, if we have periodic boundary conditions, So if we keep doing that, we always have this alpha beta here. Now, in the very last step, what will happen when we have periodic boundary conditions? So we do this a few times. And we always have this alpha and beta here. Now, in the last step when we close the boundaries, it means that we connect this alpha index with this beta index here, right? So we're not adding any new P. We're just adding a maximally entangled state acting on these two indices. And again, it will force them to be the same. So we have this matrix here. And we need alpha and beta to be the same in sum. So that's a trace of that matrix. So what we then get is that in the last step, and that's what gives us the actual state, psi, So that's the expression we ultimately get, right? So we keep multiplying these matrices. In the last step, the last entangled state amounts to taking the trace of these guys. So that's really the full expression for such a state on periodic boundary conditions, where for each side, There is a set of d by d matrices. So for each side and each value of the spin at a side, there exists a d by d matrix specifying basically how the state has to be constructed. And that's why it's called a matrix product state, because, well, the coefficients, the ci1 to in, can be obtained as matrix product states, uh, as matrix products. So maybe just, just a brief comment on the question of, uh, well, so what happens, say, for, op for open boundary conditions. Well, in some sense, we can, again, do what I said earlier. There's no need to keep all these dimensions fixed, right? So this could be a D1 times D2 dimensional matrix. It's a D2 times D3 dimensional matrix, and so on, just in a way where you know you can multiply them. Obviously, the left dimension of one has to be equal to the right dimension of the preceding one. But otherwise, you can vary the dimensions. So for instance, you can think that open boundary conditions is just a special case, where here what you do is you choose the dimension equal to 1, the last one, right? So that's a specific way of thinking what, what would happen for open boundaries. So what this would mean is that the left dimension of the leftmost A would be equal to 1, and the right one of the rightmost one, which basically would just mean that on the very left and the very right, you don't put matrices, you put vectors. And that's why there's no need for a trace. So for open boundary conditions, we would have that A1, I1, and A N, I N are what? Column or row vectors in that order. OK. So before I conclude, let me just very briefly say, well, we wanted kind of a succinct and efficient description of states with an array allow. Is this description efficient? Well,
How many parameters do we have in the simple case where all matrices have the same size? Well, we have n sides. We have d physical states. And to each side and to each physical state, we need to specify a d by d matrix. So we have d square parameters. So in total, we have n times small d times capital D parameters. So in particular, it means the number of parameters grows only linearly in the system size as opposed to exponentially for a general vector. And of course, the, relative, the, the relevant question is how big do we have to choose d to get a good description of our state? And one intuition is that d should be related to the entanglement in the state. So if there's not too much entanglement, hopefully we can choose d at a moderate size, meaning we only have a moderate number of parameters. Of course, this has to be made rigorous because there's no strict one-to-one -one correspondence between this d, if you want to describe a specific wave function and the number of parameters. But it indeed turns out there's kind of a nice relation which allows for an efficient description. Um, and that's where I will start continuing in the next lecture. Thanks. <laughs>